Welcome, Friday the 25th of May. Now I've had lots of requests to start looking at some therapeutics on these videos. So I'm going to tentatively start to do that today. And there's a drug called ivermectin which has been in the press a lot lately. So for some reason the popular news outlet seems to have got hold of this drug ivermectin. So what we want to do is look at what the actual science behind this is. And just to give you the bottom line on this, if you don't want to watch the video, um, it works in the laboratory situation. We've no idea whether it works in the real life situation. But just before you switch off, if you don't want to, uh, to listen to the rest of this, uh, at the end of this video, we're going to listen to a lovely lady called Doreen, who's had a, an appalling experience. So if you want to skip to her, then that's fine. But if you want to look at a bit about the science behind this drug ivermectin, then, then stick around for this next part. It is It is interesting. Now, I think the first thing to say here is that, there's a few things to say really. Let, let, let's say first of all that all drugs have the potential to do harm. So all drugs can potentially do harm. So you must never take any drug that's not prescribed by your own doctor or authorised prescriber for human medications. Because all drugs can be dangerous. So we don't want people taking drugs on their own initiative. They need to be officially, formally prescribed. Don't take a drug because I say so. In fact, I would never tell you to take a drug. But what terrifies me is some people on the internet do. That is absolutely terrifying. Because I don't know you as an individual. I can't tell you to take a drug. And the idea that some people suggest taking drugs on the internet is, is, is terrifying. So never take a drug unless it's prescribed for you personally by your doctor or healthcare prescriber. And the, the, the world is replete with people who've killed themselves with taking home remedies. So whatever you do, don't do that. And the next thing I want to say is that viruses are actually hard to study because bacteria are quite easy. You can just grow them up on a plate and they'll grow on their own. Just give them something to eat and they'll grow. But viruses can only grow inside human cells or inside other cells, viruses out there in the world can grow inside plant cells, animal cells, all sorts of things. But this particular virus can only grow inside animal or human cells, human cells and a small number of other animals. So they're actually quite hard to study viruses. So even though there's untold trillions of them out there, to actually study them is a little more difficult. You need to use tissue cultures. And that's what this study has done. So let's go into the detail of this. Now, the thing about this drug is it's already approved. In fact, this is one of the World Health Organization's essential drugs, uh, ivermectin. So it's an essential drug and it's used all around the world, but for treating parasites, parasitic infections. So not even bacteria on a larger scale than that, parasites. And it treats quite a few different parasitic diseases, which, of course, is, is wonderful and essential. So it's already approved for treating parasites. The question is, could it be repurposed to treating COVID-19, the severe acute respiratory syndrome, coronavirus type 2, which is causing the current pandemic? Well, why are we talking about this drug in the first place? Well, it's been previously shown to have broad spectrum antiviral activity in vitro. So in vitro, vitro literally means in glass. So we're talking about on the laboratory bench here. So in laboratory settings, ivermectin has been shown to have broad antiviral activity. And hey, we want antiviral activity, don't we? It's been demonstrated to limit uh, infection by some RNA viruses, such as, and th th this one here is the virus, that, there's different types of dengue, but this is the virus that causes dengue which is a common insect transmitted disease in many parts of the world. So in vitro, it's very good against dengue. Uh, it's got an established safety profile for human use because it's a known drug. So wouldn't it be convenient if it worked? Now, pharmacology is replete with drugs that were developed for one thing and ended up used for something else. So, for example, Viagra was uh, developed for treating angina. And it's now normally used for another purpose. So just because one drug is developed for one purpose doesn't mean say it can't be used for another purpose. That's common. Aspirin was originally developed for treating fevers and people found it was a blood thinner. 
it reduced the viscosity of the, uh, the the platelets and it's commonly used for that now it's also somewhat anti-inflammatory so the, the, the fact that a drug was developed for one thing doesn't mean say it can't be used for something else and we know it's got an established uh, human safety profile so that's encouraging now, recent reviews and meta-analysis indicate that high-dose inv Invermectin has comparable safety as the standard low-dose treatment. Right. Now, what this means is that these a meta-analysis is where someone takes many studies and combines all the data together. So what these studies seem to be indicating is that it's safer to take higher doses of Invermectin. So if it turns out you needed a much higher dose to treat COVID-19, which it may well do, then there's possibilities that this higher dose could be well tolerated by humans, according to some of these studies. So in other words, it's a drug that's already approved, and it may well be that it could be equally safe to give in higher and lower doses if it turned out that the higher doses were needed to treat COVID-19. So we're kind of onto something promising here. And it's already showed it work. We, we already know it works uh, in, in vitro against many types of viruses. But does it work specifically against COVID-19 in vitro? Uh, oh, yeah, an inhibition, an inhibitor of SARS coronavirus 2 in vitro. So people have shown it does inhibit the COVID-19 virus in experimental conditions using tissue cultures. So this is known to be effective in vitro. And a single treatment able to affect a 5,000 fold uh, reduction in viruses after 48 hours in cell cultures. So you have an infected cell culture, you treat it with ivermectin, 48 hours later there is a 5,000 fold reduction in the number of viruses present. So that is encouraging. Now, it's, uh, the, uh, it's also been shown, ivermectin's also been shown to be effective against uh, DNA virus uh, called pseudorabies this is this is a bit of a funny name for a, a virus uh, it's actually an american name it's it's actually um a virus it's not rabies at all actually because rabies is an rna virus th th this causes disease in pigs but anyway it's, it's another virus so it's ivermectin has been shown to be effective against the dna virus pseudorabies in both in vitro and in vivo now in vivo vivo vi vi viva means life a vital a vivo's life so this drug has been shown to combat a different virus in mice so what we're saying is that this we, we know it's got antiviral properties we know it's safe to use in human for the further indications and hey it's been shown to kill a different type of virus in mice but that is in vivo, that is in life. So that, that's also encouraging. So you can see there's various circumstantial bits of evidence that are coming together here. Uh, Invermectin is widely available due to its inclusion in the World Health Organization uh, model list of essential medications. So the World Health Organization considered this essential because it treats parasitic uh, infections. So what does this mean? Well, it warrants further investigation for possible benefits in humans. So does it work in humans? For COVID-19, well, we don't know. We don't know. But it warrants further investigation. It's interesting. Now, it has been used in phase three clinical trials. <coughs> now, <coughs> phase three clinical trials are trials where the drug is actually given to human people suffering from a disease and compared against a placebo, usually. So it has actually been used in phase three clinical trials in Thailand 2014 to 2017 against dengue. This is the dengue virus. Now remember, the uh, the the, the, the uh, ivermectin showed antiviral properties against dengue and against COVID-19 in vitro. So does it work in vivo, in life, against um, against dengue? Uh, well, a single daily oral dose was observed to be safe. So they thought it was safe to give, but no change in the amount of virus in the blood or clinical benefit was observed with the doses they were giving. So the trial in dengue uh, basically didn't work. So we have a situation here where, yeah, it killed dengue in vitro, in the lab, but not in vivo, in life. 
And we know that the, the ivermectin kills COVID-19 virus in vitro, but will it kill it in life? Well, we, we, we don't know. We don't know yet. So <clears throat> interesting. Now, there is a clinical trial being started, but that won't report till 2021. So we're not going to know this tomorrow. So I don't know why the press have picked up on this so much. It's an interesting candidate. There's no question about that. But it's not yet known if it's going to help COVID-19 in humans. It could well. It could well. But just to root ourselves in reality, before we listen to uh, Doreen, let, let's just see what the US uh, Food and Drug Administration, it's one of their frequently asked questions. Should I take Invermectin to prevent or treat COVID-19? What do the Food and Drug Administration say? No. While there are approved uses for Invermectin in people and animals, it is not approved for the prevention or treatment of COVID-19. You should not take any medicine to treat or prevent COVID-19 unless it has been prescribed to you by your healthcare provider and acquired from a legitimate source. Pretty strict. But I agree with every word. A recently released research article, and even here they put a disclaimer on, so I'm going to do the same, described the effect of Invermectin on SARS coronavirus 2 in laboratory settings, in other words, in vitro settings. These type of laboratory studies are commonly used at an early stage of drug development. Additional testing is needed to determine whether Ivermectin might be appropriate to, tr to prevent or treat coronavirus or COVID-19. Now, this is, as of today, this is the 25th of May. I took, from, I took this from the website about 10 minutes before I made this video. Is there an emergency use authorization for Invermectin in the United States to prevent or treat coronavirus or COVID-19? No. FDA has has created a special emergency program for possible therapies. It uses every available method to move treatments to patients as quickly as possible, while at the same time finding out whether they are helpful or harmful. We continue to, to support clinical trials that are testing new treatments for COVID-19 so we can gain valuable knowledge about their safety and effectiveness. Well, that's a long way of saying I don't know, mate. So there you go, it's not approved at the moment. So um, interesting potential drug, certainly very interesting, works in the lab. You know, it really is surprising how little work has been done. Or I don't know if there's very little work being done on antivirals, but we have very few antiviral drugs available. The only antiviral drugs I've ever given have been for, for herpes which can cause systemic infection. We can give, a, we can give that intravenously sometimes, as, as well as the, uh, the, the cream for cold sores. But other than that, I haven't used any antiviral drugs, I don't think. And um, it really is surprising that we don't have more antivirals. We've got a whole range of antibiotics. There's problems with them, of course, but antiviral drugs, we're still at a relatively primitive stage. So if, if the, you could get COVID-19 and the doctor says, well, here's a pill that'll take it away, then the problem would be basically solved. But we haven't. And from the, re from the evidence here, um, and given that this clinical trial for this particular drug, ivermectin, doesn't report till 2021. Um, where is it? Yeah, tw June 2021. Look, look up the, uh, the reference by all means. Um, nothing it's not going to be an immediate benefit so I read the press reports on this and I thought oh that looks encouraging I started researching it and actually end up being a bit disappointed now let's hear from uh, Doreen who's had an appalling uh, experience and, and thank you so much Doreen for sending this in and allowing your, your appalling experience to be shared with people so other people can benefit from it Yeah, good morning, Dr. John. Um, my name is Doreen. Um, I had the virus probably two months ago, and the thing that I believe saved my life was the sun. Um, I had pretty much every symptom that they've found to date. 
um, sore throat, weakness, fevers, chills, um, difficulty breathing. Um, one of the symptoms that I had that I haven't heard of with anyone else um, was the heaving. Um, I was violently heaving. I had nothing in my stomach for two days and uh, my daughter uh, sat at the end of my bed and literally thought she was going to lose me. I couldn't so much as take a sip of water. Um, the heaving was so violent um, and then th at the worst part I had become so weak uh, with the diarrhea and the pains in my stomach and just exhaustion and not being able to breathe well. Um, I had become so weak that um, I couldn't sit on the toilet. Um, I actually dragged myself outside um, probably two days before that um, and sat in the sun. It was 65 one day and 70 the next. I live in New York and I dragged myself outside and forced myself to breathe in that hot air and to get the vitamin D because of the um, the videos that I had watched with you every single day for the past two months. Um, I think that saved my life. I, I really, really believe um, that and the fact that, you know, I wasn't alone. You know, I think that's a big factor. My daughter wanted to send me to the hospital and I refused to go because I, I didn't want to die alone and I really thought I was going to die. Um, but um, that's all I can say is um, some of the things that you had mentioned early in your videos um, had really, really made a significant difference in the recovery. Absolutely. Doreen, I just can't thank you enough for, for sending that in. You've had this most appalling experience and uh, you, you've chosen to, to share it with other people. Thank you very much. You've obviously had a really bad time. I am so pleased you were better. So the weakness, the fever and the chills. Now the chills, the reason you feel cold is because that's your body trying to warm up. The chills are you actually trying to warm up. So you feel chilled when your temperature is increasing because we know the immune system works best when you're having a fever. The shortness of breath must have been quite an alarming feature as well. Now the heaving, in the UK we tend to call that retching. It's <coughs> kind of like that when you, you, you feel like you're going to be sick, but sometimes you're not getting anything out. So the, the heaving is to do with vomiting and retching. And uh, for two days you had that really bad. That must be appalling. And... Um, and by just after two days, you were probably a bit dehydrated after that. So I imagine your urine volumes went down. So this can happen. And in hospitals, that's why we sometimes give intravenous fluids. So um, you're right. You're just taking small frequent sips of water is the thing to do. But you couldn't even keep that down. So it's not surprising you were weak. And I'm just so pleased that um, that, that you've you've got over this and that, that you're, uh, you're looking better now. Um Going outside, it worked for you. That, that's that's just that's just wonderful. Um, fresh air, fresh air is always. If you can get fresh air, it's always a good thing. Um, so, but basically, thank you for sharing that experience. We we appreciate that.